I'm going to read all six verses. It's a short chapter. I should uh, probably call this message, Seven Women Shall Lay Hold of One Man, or The Glory of God in His Church in the Last Days. Do you have it? Isaiah 4, chapter. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every place, every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. Let's pray that God will open this to us now. Heavenly Father, I come to you and ask that the Holy Spirit rest upon me. O Holy Spirit, possess my very being from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and bring forth this truth, O God. Reveal your heart. You're speaking to us about what the church is going to be like in the last days. Doesn't have to guess about it, Lord. You've made it very, very clear. What a clear prophetic word this is from Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah is dead and gone many years, but, oh God, his word lives now. Should Isaiah live today, he would see it very, very clearly. He looked down through history and he saw our day. And, oh God, I pray now that you take authority over every demon spirit, every principality and power of darkness, every seductive spirit of Satan that would try to rob us of the truth. Open the word to us tonight. Give me unction and anointing from heaven, oh God. Pierce us with your word. Speak to us. Lord, open our eyes. Help us to understand what's happening in these last days to the church. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, according to the prophet Isaiah, there are going to be two kinds of churches existing in the last days. And those two kinds of churches are here. They are in existence. And we don't have to speculate about what they're going to be like because the prophet Isaiah has given us a very, very clear picture of what these two church streams are going to be like just before Jesus comes. Now here in Isaiah, the fourth chapter, in verse 1, Isaiah gives a very concise but tragic description of what I'm going to call the church of forgiveness only. The church of forgiveness only. Would you say that with me? The church of forgiveness only. Okay, I want you to remember that. Verse 1, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Look at me, folks. This is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in all the Bible. Now, some Bible scholars, uh, theologians, say that that happened during the time of Ahaz, when the enemy came in and 120,000 uh, of Israel were killed, men were killed in a very short time. But folks, that's only speculation. There's no evidence whatsoever that this scripture has ever been fulfilled any time in history. There's no, no evidence that even in the time of Ahaz, seven women took hold of one man and fulfilled this scripture verse. I see something much deeper. In fact, I searched all through my commentaries everywhere, and I, when the Holy Spirit gave this to me, I, I said, well, Lord, uh, I, I feel humbled by this, but it, uh, th I, I can't see it in any of the books. But the Lord said, you don't have to see it in any book. It's so clear. And I want you to follow me, if you will. You're not going to see it in a commentary, but let me tell you, this whole fourth chapter is prophetic. This is Isaiah seeing clearly, unmistakably, what these two church streams are going to be like just prior to the coming of the Lord. In fact, these two streams have been like this ever since the last days. When Jesus came, born in a manger, and the New Testament church was raised up from Pentecost right on to this day is called the last days. We're in the last of the last days. 
When Jesus came, he instituted the beginning of the last days. Peter stood up and, and he said, he's, this is that was spoken come to pass in the last days. So he pronounced the last days on the day of Pentecost. So how many believe we're living in the last of the last days? There's no question about that. Now, Paul wrote, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, Paul, in speaking of God's dealing with Israel, said this, now these things are our examples. They were written for us upon whom the ends of the world have come. This whole chapter is written for us right now. Now, in the first chapter of Revelation, you know that chapter very well. Jesus is seen by John as coming and standing in the midst of seven candlesticks, seven golden candlesticks. His eyes are a flame of fire. His feet are burning as, as uh, burnished uh, uh, brass. And it's a frightful sight that John was so smitten with, he fell on his face in fear. And this is the same John who used to lean his head on the bosom of Jesus. And now he sees him in this uh, state and he is stricken and falls to his face. And the scripture makes it very clear <clears throat> that these seven candlesticks are seven churches. Now you know that the church is referred to in the feminine term uh, in the Bible as the bride. It's always referred to as she. Now I want you to follow me very close now. These seven would-be brides <clears throat> represent seven churches. It means the whole body of Christianity, that which calls itself religion, that which calls itself the church, including the denominations, including everything that's called religious. Jesus is walking among the seven candlesticks and he is piercing. His eyes are piercing. I don't know, surely from what John says, he was grieved so much so to the Laodiceans. He said, I'll spit you out of my mouth unless you acknowledge that you're naked and blind and need help. And uh, the, all of the warnings that came forth from his, from that time on, the piercing eyes of Jesus. These seven women represent those seven churches going after one man. His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now I want you to follow me very closely now, please. These seven would-be brides are not interested in intimacy or love. They have but one thing on their minds. It's, let's read it again. Let, only let us be called by thy name and take away our, what? Our reproach. Listen to what Proverbs 14.34 reads. Sin is what? A reproach to any people. It's sin. Now I want you to get the picture, please. Here are seven bride, would-be brides. And they're coming to this man. And they're saying, look, <clears throat> you don't have to provide for us. You don't have to provide bread. We will provide our own bread. You don't have to provide any apparel. We'll provide our own clothing, our own robes. Folks, you don't have to be very deep spiritually to get the significance. Can you see what I'm talking about? There is going to rise a church in the last days, and he uses the figure seven because in every church system, there are going to be these kind of people in all churches. It's been that way even since Pentecost. There have been this kind of people, this kind of would-be bride. Who, who want to be married for one reason, to remove the reproach of sin, the guilt and the condemnation of sin. They don't want intimacy. They don't want to live under the same roof. They want to provide their own gospel, our own bread. They don't want the bread that comes down out of heaven, which is Jesus Christ crucified, resurrected, and seated at the right hand of the Father. They have their own gospel. It's a man-made, self-centered gospel. It's a feel-good gospel. And we have churches all over the United States just like this. They want nothing more than to have the reproach of sin removed. They don't want to live with guilt. They don't want to live with fear and with condemnation. And so it's called, I call it, the church of forgiveness only. Now, I want you to know that I believe in justification by faith. By faith alone in Jesus Christ. 
I stand firm as any preacher in America, the whole face of this earth, that it's not by works, but we are justified by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I believe that. I'm sold on it. I preach it. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. I believe that you can live without fear and guilt and condemnation. I believe all of that. But if that's all you want, if that's your whole focus, nothing else, you don't want to be intimate with Jesus. You don't want the bread that comes down from heaven that searches and convicts. You don't want to come under the consuming fire eyes of Jesus Christ. You don't want to know him intimately. You don't want to walk with him. You just want to be forgiven. In the last days, there will be a church that goes after forgiveness only. That is all they will preach. Come to Jesus. Lay hold of him. You can walk your own walk and talk your own talk. You can have all this in Jesus too. No holiness preaching. No separation from the world. No preaching of sanctification. No dealing with sin. But we will provide our own bread. You don't have to feed us, Jesus. We have our own little gospel. The Bible says they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And there are churches all over America that will give you pablum. They'll give you candy cotton. They'll give you a gospel that fe makes you feel good. You can come and say, oh, I, I, uh, I feel great. I saw something that just broke my heart. I saw a so-called Christian rock group setting up. They were, I, w I, w I was going through this, I was in this particular town for meetings and I walked past a, uh, a big, uh, amphitheater. They're going to have a big Christian rock show. And I watched these kids setting up their equipment and they had t-shirts with a four-letter word, blank guilt. Blank guilt. I couldn't even quote the word to you. These were so-called Christians. All they wanted to do, get rid of guilt. I've had people, we've had people that used to come to this church that do not come here now. They will never come back here again because they say, I was too condemned. I felt guilty. Folks, don't dare go to a church where you don't have the sword of the Lord piercing into the innermost being till you feel the guilt of your sin. We're not saved by the law, but the law has a purpose. The law is a mirror that holds up, holds up before you the commands and the demands of God. And you see that you can't fulfill those demands and it drives you to the cross. It drives you to Jesus. But God help you if you don't have that kind of preaching. There are churches today with thousands of people that have 10 minute skits. And some of those skits are, are absolutely horrific, horrible. There's no gospel to it, but they say, well, people don't want the gospel. We'll give them what they want. And so they give them a little bit of candy cotton gospel. They give them forgiveness only messages and try to make them feel good. But what's going to happen, folks? When the economy collapses, what's going to happen when the storms come and they're not ready? This is going to be a last day's church wanting to be the bride of Christ on its own terms. It's going to be an arrangement without intimacy, without true love, without devotion. There are so many churches today with thousands of people packed in that all they can say, I believe, I believe. The Bible said the devils believe. And they tremble and some of them aren't even trembling. There are people who are not trembling. Demons believe and tremble. They don't want to live under this man's roof. You don't have to provide us shelter or a covering. We will provide our own bread. That's a gospel of self. And the Bible said that bread is defiled. It's self-centered. It has to do with prosperity. It has to do with come to Jesus and you can just be happy. Folks, there are times that I am not happy. I weep. I cry over lost souls. Now, I've got an abiding joy that no devil in hell can take out of my soul.
but not for the life of my going to be a whoopee Christian. No burden of the Lord. No weeping over the sins of Zion. No feeling the heart of God for what's happening in these last days. The Bible said it's the bread of mourners, Hosea 9, 4. They give the bread of mourners and they eat thereof. They that eat thereof shall be polluted. Their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. The true house of God, that holy remnant church, will have nothing to do with this man-made bread. A little bit of pop psychology and a few scriptures thrown in to make it sound religious. Hmm? There's some preachers that need to go to school and get their license and be psychiatrists or be psychologists and quit cheating the people. If they're going to be psychologists, why don't they charge 50 bucks and get something out of it? I'm not trying to be facetious, folks. There's just a lot of pop psychology, a pop gospel with no conviction. Bread. Man-made bread. We will provide our own bread. And we will wear our own apparel. And they, they, they say to this man, you don't have to provide us with the robe. We will make our own robes. We will clothe ourselves. So you see, there's no robe of righteousness. There's no holiness preaching, no reproof, nothing negative, no separation from the world. We will dress as we please. Are you beginning to see what the prophet is saying? These would-be brides have no desire to submit to the authority of a husband. They're not interested in his needs. They're not wanting to know his heart. Folks, if they were really in love with this man, if they really, really had a devoted heart, they would want to be able to be near him to minister to his needs all they're thinking about is their need to get the reproach off their back, and that's all. Not concerned about a husband, intimacy. Not going to allow the husband to do what his work is to do to provide. We will provide ourselves. Why do they need a... I, I wonder some people what, even think they need a God. They're doing pretty well on their own. They've got it all figured out. They really, that's what this is all about. We provide ourselves. The only thing we want is the reproach gone. Just get rid of our reproach. We will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name. And they want to be called Christians. And they want and take away our reproach. Now that's, that's the church that I see really taking root now all over the United States. <clears throat> I had a brother meet me just before service. He's here tonight, visiting from a large southern city. He said, Pastor Dave, I just had to leave my church. He said they, 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 they sent a whole delegation, elders and others, and flew them across the country to a place where they're supposed to have great manifestations. Came back all excited. He said, I can't be a part of it. I have to leave. He said, Brother Dave, what's happening to our churches? Where's the discernment? What? Folks, as I told you, I've got over 700,000 people on my mailing list that get these messages that I preach from this pulpit. And I am getting calls and letters, and it's shocking. It's heartbreaking. It grieves my heart. I said, Brother Wilson, we don't know. Our pastor's bringing in stuff that... that that's just tearing our church apart. The, the place is being split, and we don't know what to believe anymore. All kinds of stuff now. They've got a new thing now called birthing, where the people are rolling on the floor, doubled up in a fetal position, screaming like they're having a baby, and they say they're birthing sanctification. Folks, when is it going to end? Where does it end? Such foolishness is going on, and there's no discernment. And it's man-made bread and so much, so much that is not of God that grieves the heart of God. He said, Brother Dave, he said, is it it's because the pastors are not intimate with Jesus? Folks, it's that intimacy. Out of that intimacy comes direction. Out of the intimacy 
comes the knowing what is right and wrong, what is holy, what is impure. Out of that intimacy with Jesus comes a firmness where you are not tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine, but you know who you are and where you're at. Folks, every time some uh, body comes to the greater New York area and they're going to be having some big meeting, you know, and it's going to be excitement and, and uh, you know, I know, I know in my mind there are certain people that sit here, I know they're going to be right there. They're going to run to everything that's exciting. They're going to run here and there, helter and skelter. Even though we say, hey, you don't have to run anywhere when you have it in your heart. You don't have to be somebody running all over the place. And I know there are certain ones. If I go to that meeting, I can count them. I know. I want to move on now to the other church. The good church. The church I call the church of God's glory. In that day, second chapter. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Who is the branch? Jesus is the branch. All through the Old Testament, the branch is coming forth is Jesus Christ. And the Bible said there's going to be a church to whom he will appear beautiful and glorious. Hallelujah. Excellent. Comely means handsome. Lovely. Beautiful. For them that are escaped of Israel. Now, folks, those that are escaped of Israel, there's going to be a clear, cutting, burning message. You're going to find that in verse 4. There's going to be a purging in the midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. That's going to be convicting Holy Ghost preaching. And a lot of people are going to flee to Babylon and into captivity. And there will only be a remnant that remains. He's talking about a remnant church. Folks, the church that's going to please God in the last days is not going to be the multi, multi thousands. Just because it's big doesn't mean God loves it. God despises some of the bigness. He despises it. Now, it doesn't mean that he can't be in something that's big and glorious. But folks, much of what we're seeing today does not represent the heart of God. The heart of the Lord is in this church where his glory is going to fall, the church of God's glory, where Jesus becomes the center of attraction. Everything is based and built around his character, around his presence. It's the church of, in love with Jesus Christ. It's the church intimate with Jesus Christ. It's the church focused on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Beloved, there is right now on this planet a remnant church that desires nothing but Christ. The Bible said they have escaped of Israel. A remnant, they have come through a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Those left in Zion, verse 3, shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. They say, well, Brother David, <clears throat> this has to do only with ancient Israel. Ancient Jerusalem, Jerusalem is named and Zion is named. That pinpoints it to a certain time in history during the time of the prophet Isaiah. But listen to what the scripture says. But Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. There is another Jerusalem. There is a spiritual Jerusalem that is the mother of all believers. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you come in to Zion. You're born in Zion and your name is recorded in Zion. Those that have fully, fully given their heart to Jesus Christ, who are intimate with Him, belong to Him, and known as sons and daughters, they are born in Zion, and they are of the new Jerusalem above, which is the mother of us all. Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, unto the heavenly Jerusalem. There's a heavenly Jerusalem. The city of my God which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. It's a heavenly Jerusalem. How many see that? There's a heavenly Jerusalem. This is what the prophet Isaiah is talking about. A heavenly-minded people, a remnant people that the Lord is going to bring through a spirit of burning, 
And God is called a consuming fire. He's called a consuming fire. And the best evidence that this chapter is for us in these last days is that he talks about a cloud coming and a pillar of fire. Another cloud and another pillar of fire. Well, you know that the cloud in the, uh, in the wilderness had already passed away. He does not have the cloud and the fire in his day. He's talking about our day. God is going to create a new thing. And we're going to be talking about it. The cloud had to do with direction, comfort. The pillar of fire, they knew exactly when to go and where to go. And this holy remnant church is going to have clear direction in the last days. There'll be no confusion. When everything around is spinning apart, everything is shaking, this holy remnant church is going to have a cloud and a pillar of fire. Let me read it to you again, verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the Spirit of judgment by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night. That's a pillar of fire. Now, look at me, please, and hear me. Israel had one tabernacle in the wilderness. They had one cloud and one pillar of smoke. But now, we are many tabernacles. Your body is a tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. My body is a tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. Now, here is the prophet coming to us and saying, there is going to be over every tabernacle, every one of us, everyone that belongs to this church of the glory of God, every one of them, going to have a cloud hanging over them. And they're going to have a pillar of fire. That means God says, I'm going to see you through no matter what the situation is in your society, whether everything comes apart, you are going to be a people under a cloud. And you're going to be a people even at nighttime, in the darkest hour, the worst storm in your life. You're going to see your way through because I'm going to give you a pillar of fire. It's going to lead you through these last days. <coughs> Hallelujah. If someone comes to me and says, Brother Wilson, you you got to go with us. There's a great revival broken out, and they're going to name me a place. And they say, you got to go there, man. It's just it's it's marvelous. People are just falling everywhere. And uh, folks, I'm not against falling because I've fallen many times. I worked for five years with Catherine Coleman in her meetings. She's a dear friend of mine for years, and I saw people fall in the Holy Ghost that was absolutely awesome. There was no manipulation. There was no pushing. It was a genuine, awesome work of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for those five years. And, and I loved her and knew her to her dying day. But folks, if people are going to tell me there's a great move of God somewhere, my first question is going to be this. And it's a question you'd better ask before you run anywhere. Is God's word there being preached with a consuming fire? Are people falling under conviction for sin? Is the cry of the people for purging away of the spirit of this world? Because the Bible says here, he's going to wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion. He's going to purge the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Ask, is that spirit consuming fire of the Holy Ghost there convicting of sin? Do you hear a message that, that make you be... You want to fall on your face. Does it drive you to Jesus? Does it convict you of sin? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? When he, the Holy Ghost, comes, he will what? Reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. You tell me the Holy Ghost has come down? Then this must happen. It must be there. Ask for it. Look, look for it. Is there holiness is the result? Is the Spirit doing what the Bible says he will do by convicting of sin? Is there a strong message of reproof? Is Jesus Christ the sum of it all? My son Gary called me last night from Colorado. Pastor's in Denver. And he said, Dad, I went to a meeting two weeks ago, and, and things just went crazy. Just everything. The manifestations went crazy. In fact, it almost frightened the leaders. And they, they had to get up and say, 
All right, now let's bring this all back to Jesus. And my son said, Dad, they said it was the Holy Ghost, and now they're saying, let's bring it all back to Jesus. Well, where were they? Where were they? They have to bring it back to Jesus. Folks, that makes me weep. That's frightening. Let's bring it back to Jesus. It shouldn't have been anywhere else but Jesus. Focused on him. The Holy Remnant Church is going to be led completely by the Holy Spirit upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies. These are going to be remnant churches here and there where there are a remnant people who come not to see something, not to feel something, not to have a show, but to meet Him. To meet Him. To minister to Him. The Bible said in the last day there are going to be some ministers and others who are going to be able to minister to the house. They'll minister to the outer court. But He said they'll not be ministered to me. They will not minister at my table. They are from Ichabod. They're from the Abiathar priesthood. They're not the Zadok priesthood. They will not come to my house. They'll not be at my table. But they'll be out there ministering to the people. Folks, I don't want to be out there. I want to be in the Holy of Holies feasting on Jesus. Folks, right now, there's raging through America a storm of confusion in Christianity. There's so little discernment. There's so much false doctrine. There's so much foolishness and so much that is a flesh. And, and I told you this before I'm going to repeat it now. There are so many people that are confused, absolutely confused. May I tell you that you don't have to walk in confusion? If, if, if I'm going to pastor a church here in New York City, if I am called by God to lead a people to the judgment day, well, one day I have to stand before his throne as a pastor. And for my part, I have to stand there. First of all, I have to face everything I've said and done. I have to face the judgment. And I, I, I believe I'm going to stand there with full assurance because there's no other plea but his blood and his righteousness. I have to watch every one of you that were here and considered sheep of this flock. I have to stand there. And the thought of it is very chilling. But to stand before there and answer whether or not we brought you in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ, whether we preach strong enough and straight enough, even though sometimes it hurts. And I'm going to have to be able to stand there and say, Jesus, I stood in the pulpit and I warned against running here and there and everywhere trying to find Jesus. Because the only people who have to run are those who won't pay the price. They don't want to spend the hour shut in with Jesus to get to know him. They don't want to take this Bible and discipline themselves and shut off the Babylonian idiot box for a couple hours. They don't want to pay a price. They don't want to have to go through the pain and the sacrifice. They want to run somewhere and get a word from somebody. They want somebody to knock them down and hopefully knock out the sin out of their life. And it doesn't work that way, folks. It doesn't work that way. God works on each individual when you shut yourself alone. This is a one-to-one -one thing, and you have to stand before Jesus one day. You have to answer. Did you let the Word do its work in your heart? Now listen to this. I'm coming down to the heart of my message here now. Verse 5. <clears throat> For upon all the glory shall be a defense. Now look at that. I don't know what your rendition says, but the original Hebrew should read, Over all shall be a covering of glory. Over all this people, this remnant people, over all these assemblies that are the holy remnant assemblies. The Bible says there's going to be a covering. There's going to be a covert. There's going to be a hiding place. There's going to be a blanket, so to speak. There's going to be a covering, and it's going to be the glory of God. How many want to see the glory of God? 
I mean, I want to see it in this church. I mean abiding glory of God. Folks, not only in this church, but in your heart. Where you have it all day long, there's a glory covering over your life. Now, folks, listen to it. For upon all the glory shall be a defense, meaning over all shall be a covering of glory. Now, remember in Exodus, don't turn to Exodus 4, the chapter, there was a cloud of glory that covered the tabernacle in the wilderness. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What are you and what am I? The tabernacle of the Holy Ghost, God's dwelling place, where God dwells. Listen to what happened in Solomon's temple, his tabernacle. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Now, every time the tabernacle was in divine order, every time the tabernacle was completed according to his design and prepared, the glory of the Lord came down and filled it. Now, folks, here's Isaiah saying in the last days there's going to be a holy remnant church and all shall be covered with glory. The glory of God. Now, folks, listen to me, please. The glory of God is nothing more, nothing less than the presence, the manifested presence of Jesus. Manifested means to lay hold of by the hand. That's what it means, to lay hold of. So real, so evident, so absolutely true that your spiritual hand can reach out and touch it. In your spiritual eye, you can see it, you can feel it. It's manifested, it's evident, it's real. It's just as real as the breath I breathe, just as real as this book that I touch. It's real. Now, folks, the glory of God, I have prayed for years. Oh, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. And, oh, the Lord began to deal with me. He said, well, what are you looking for, David? Are you looking for what most people are looking for? Some kind of visible manifestation where, 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 where people are just... Uh, giving themselves over to uh, some manifestation. What is it you're looking for? That's when God made it so clear to my heart, and you must understand it tonight. You don't get anything else. The glory of God, the glory of the Father, is Jesus Christ, His own Son. The branch of the Lord will be to them beautiful and glorious. Hebrews 1.3, His Son being the brightness of His glory. His Son is the brightness of his glory. It, the glory can't get any brighter than Jesus manifesting himself in this house. When Jesus come, he came in silence tonight. Some of you didn't recognize him. He came in that moment of silence. Now, he's been here all night, but he came in a very special manifestation. Sometimes he manifests in great, glorious praises because God inhabits the praises of his people. But there are other times that he just comes down and that sweetness the aroma of Christ begins to fill the whole house. I know when Jesus comes. I know it. I can feel it. I reach out. I can touch it. It's the glory of God. It's the manifest presence of Jesus. He said, you love me and obey my commandments. I will come to you and I will manifest myself to you. I will. Folks, the kind of revival I want to see in New York City is the kind where the glory of God comes down and meaning the presence of Jesus becomes so powerful, so overwhelming, so glorious, so comely, so beautiful. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent. The fruit of the, the conversions. These will not be people who vote for Jesus. You know, raise your hand, vote for Jesus. It won't be somebody coming up and repeating a sinner's prayer. It'll be people convicted of their sin by the presence of the Lord. The Holy Ghost being present. The Holy Spirit will hover over the building where there is sometimes such an awesome quietness. People just get up and start coming to the Lord. We're going to see it here in this church. We've already seen some of it happening already. Even in the middle of the service, people being convicted. The Lord's presence so powerful. And people just get up and come. And now, folks, those that are coming forward, most of them are weeping and broken before the Lord. It's just the beginning. Because the glory of the Lord is beginning to appear in Times Square Church. 
And the glory of the Lord is not only going to appear here, it's going to appear. This is going to be the real revival. This is going to be the real outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Ghost is outpoured, doesn't it, Scripture said, He will manifest Christ. He will bring to you in your remembrance all the words that Jesus spoke. He will show you things to come. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The manifestation I want to see. If people are going to fall, I want them to fall right here, convicted of sin, and get a vision of Jesus, and get up and be a new creature in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and oh boy, when that sin is gone, and when the consuming fire has done its purging work, and the blood has been applied, and there has been a heart-rending reaching out to Jesus Christ, I wish they'd laugh all night long. I mean, let the laughter come. Let the joy of the Lord come because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. When, he, when the ark was taken, Samuel dies and the sons of Eli are slain. Eli's daughter-in-law gave birth to Ichabod. Because the ark was taken, and they said, the glory of the Lord has departed. I would not want to attend a church where the glory of the Lord has departed. I don't ever want to be able, I, I don't ever want it said before a holy God in my own heart and my prayer that the glory of God departed my soul. If I don't have the presence of Jesus, I can't live. And that should be your testimony tonight. I can't exist without the presence of the Lord. He has to be my guide. He has to be my cloud. He has to be my pillar of fire. Now, in closing, let me, let me show you. Why do we need the glory of God? Why do we need the presence of Jesus in every meeting? Folks, it shouldn't be just on Sunday, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, every time we meet, every little prayer group. And it should be in your house when you're alone with the Lord praying. The presence of Jesus. The presence of the Lord. Why is it so important? Last verse. Look at it. Verse 6. After the glories are covering, then there shall be a tabernacle for shadow in the daytime from the heat. How many know what the heat means? The scorching judgments of God. The Bible makes it clear that uh, it... In Revelation 16, the fourth angel of the judgment was given power to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God. Folks, God's turning up the heat. Things are going to get very hot. Oh, it is going to get so hot. Judgments on all sides. But he said, the glory of God is going to be your covering. The glory of God is going to be a shadow in the daytime. From this heat. You're not going to feel the heat. You're going to be in a nice, cool, wonderful shadow of the wings of Jesus. You're going to hide under shadow. That's why it's important to get close to him. I want to be right under his wing, don't you? I want to be sheltered from the heat. And a place of refuge and a covering from storm and from rain. Oh, folks, it's beginning to rain. Not just the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but judgments are beginning to fall. The storm clouds are gathering. But oh, hallelujah, there's going to be glory in the church. That glory is going to be a shelter. It's going to be a shelter. Folks, I can't begin to describe to you all that that means. But I do know one thing. He said, I'm going to be with you. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what happens, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What is the glory of God? Jesus manifested in our midst. How many understand that now? Will you stand with me, please? Forgiveness, yes, but much more. That's not the only focus. The focus is, Lord... I want to get to know you. I want intimacy with you. I want your glory in my life. Hallelujah. Love it up in the balcony and here on the main floor. 
There are many of you. I know it. I see it on you. You have the glory of God. Because Jesus goes with you everywhere you go. Some of you on the subways. Some of you even on your job. I know many of you are going to go home tonight before you go to bed. And you're just going to have a wonderful time with Jesus. Because you've learned intimacy with him. He is the whole world to you. Do you pray like I do? I pray, oh God, you know I don't want anything of this world. I don't want its money. I don't want its fame. I don't want anything material. Lord, without you, this world doesn't make sense. There's nothing here for me. I don't want it. They can have it. I want you, Jesus. I want you. The Holy Spirit has just put a word in my heart. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? He put a word in my heart. The Holy Spirit just gave it to me. I want to share it with you. The word is emptiness. Emptiness. Without that intimacy, you have nothing but emptiness in your heart. And I'm going to give an invitation for those who are honest enough to admit, Pastor David, that's me. There's a dull emptiness inside my spirit and my heart. And some of you used to walk with Jesus, and I don't know what happened. I don't know where you got off. I don't know where you went astray. But the Lord says, come home. I want an invitational number here. Coming home. That's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to come home. Up in the balcony. I'm going to pray. And you're going to sense the Holy Spirit. Jesus is here. I said, Jesus is here. He's been manifesting his presence all night. And you are in his presence. Follow these that are coming right now. Up in the balcony, go to either end, either side, down any stairs and down any aisle, and we'll meet you here. You've got that emptiness in you. The Lord wants to fill you. He wants to satisfy you. He wants to transform your life. Some of you have been running. There's some husbands and wives need to take each other by the hand and walk down here and say, Honey, let's settle this tonight. Obey the Holy Spirit. Jesus is here. Come on home. This is the conclusion of the message. 